This video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you need a website or domain, check out Squarespace for an all-in-one platform. Hey everybody, and welcome back to a new video. Does this look a little bit too familiar? In this video, I'm going to cover the topic that I actually get asked for the most. That is my workflow for importing, processing, cataloging, and backing up my photos. Make sure you stick around for my bonus tip, which is a big one for Lightroom users, where I share with you the big no-no that Lightroom users make all the time around backing up their photos. My name is Simon Dantremont, and I'm a professional nature and wildlife photographer living in Eastern Canada. I make weekly videos giving you photo tips or taking you behind the scenes for nature photography. Subscribe if you want to see more. In this video, I'm gonna cover both photos and video because these days I do a lot of both. So my workflow starts when I get back home from a photography and videography trip, and it's time to get my photos off the memory cards and into my computer or storage device. My photos and video can either be on SSD drives that my Atomos Ninja 5 uses to record the view of my viewfinder, CF Express, which I use for my R5 for photos and video, SD cards, which I use in my R6 and my R8, or micro SD from my drone and GoPro. On some of these devices, you can download from the device via USB, which can be quite quick, but I like to use card readers. Rather than use the SD card reader on my PC, I usually get better results via the card reader plugged into my USB-C port, which is Thunderbolt and really fast. Look for the lightning symbol for Thunderbolt, and it's a great thing to shop for in your next laptop purchase. I'm using an HP Omen 17-inch laptop with i9 processor, 32 gigabytes of RAM, an NVIDIA RTX 3080 video card. Nice, fast system, which I can process 4K slow motion, no problem. When I'm in my living room, I plug in a direct gigabit ethernet cable into my laptop, connected to my router. When I'm in the office, I connect one cable from an HP G2 dock that I connect with one USB-C cable to my laptop, and I instantly have access to a camera for streaming, like what you're seeing me through right now, a 27 inch monitor, external audio card and speakers and ethernet. These ethernet speeds are important for me as I edit video footage directly from my storage device, not my laptop. Now let's start with photos, which is where I start. I often have both photos and video on the same card and I treat them differently. I use Lightroom for my photo processing, but it also plays a key role in cataloging my photos and organizing them. The other huge benefit is that Lightroom is non-destructive. That is, it never destroys your original photo. What it does is it applies changes to your photo, which it remembers and stores into a file called a catalog with the changes stored. While this is a great feature, it introduces an extra step. It's that in order for you to have processed images backed up, you'll need to save the original photo, like a RAW file, if you shoot RAW like I do, and the catalog of adjustments which Lightroom applied. If you lose track of your catalog, you'll still have your photos, but all your processing changes will be lost. Remember, if your image processing software is destructive, that is, it alters the original image so that you can't get it back, you may want to make a duplicate of the photo to process rather than processing the original. Photo contests will often ask for the original raw photo, for example. Now we have two choices when downloading your photos to storage. Just pick the ones you want on your card or download them all and call them on the computer. Myself, I download them all and call them on the computer. Now Lightroom needs to build previews of your photos to display them on the screen. It turns out your camera has done the same to be able to show your RAW files on the back LCD. As such, under Build Previews, if you click Embedded and Sidecar, Lightroom will download the JPEGs your camera made and use those. I use this option, which works well for me for culling quickly. I then download the photos using Lightroom directly onto my network attached storage, or NAS. More on that later. I download them into files and folders based on year and date but I'll show you later that this isn't the only way that I can access them later. The reason I download all my pics into Lightroom for culling is to take advantage of a great culling feature in Lightroom. After downloading, make sure you have Photo, Auto Advance selected, and all you have to do is hit X to reject and P to pick. So XXXXXP, XXXXXP, you get the idea. I can go through a thousand photos in no time. Now when you call your images, how do you decide what to keep and how many? This will really depend on the genre and your style of photography. 
As a wildlife photographer, my goal is to keep less than 5%, preferably 2 to 3%. That's because I take 1,500 shots in one morning, so 20 or 30 or 40 keepers is plenty. But how do you choose? While I spent years pixel peeping images to keep the sharpest photos, I don't anymore, and I encourage you to look beyond sharpness in culling. Great compositions, compelling stories, great action shots, and photos that capture your attention will trump sharpness every time, even if only 90% or 80% is sharp. In some genres, sharpness isn't that important. A tip for wildlife photographers, and this would apply to pets and some other genres as well, look for the photos where it looks like the wildlife is saying something, and adding a caption at the bottom would seem just right. These are storytelling photos and work great on social media too, like these photos, a grumpy wood duck, a curious blue jay, and a singing red-winged blackbird. If a caption looks really obvious, that's the shot to keep. You can also rank your photos from one to five stars in Lightroom during the culling process. When I come across a really good photo amongst a bunch, I may rate it five stars so I can go back a week later and find it really easily. I'd like to thank the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. I built my own website using Squarespace and I have no coding experience. It was easy. If you're a creative artist, having a website is the easiest way to display your work and connect with your customers. Setting up an online store is easy and you can sell physical or digital products easily and quickly, accepting payments online, even from international clients. You can display your work in galleries along with other media like videos. You can even have member areas and sell membership access to exclusive privileges. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Simon to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. After my photos are imported in Lightroom, I sometimes tag them by species, activity, or other features so I can find them later. If I need a short-eared owl photo, I can search for SEO for short-eared owl and find them later. Lightroom also has a nice feature, the means to search by camera, lens, or settings. If I want to make a video on shooting at high ISO, for example, I can easily find the photos I shot over ISO 10,000. Or, which photos I shot with my Canon R6. Here's another great feature. If you want to buy a new prime lens, you can even check out what focal length you've been using the most, or on your zoom lenses the most often. A great feature before you go out and buying a new lens. After I process my photos, I export them in a file size best suited for social media and my website. And that's 2048 pixels on the long side. That's the largest dimensions that Facebook and Instagram won't try to resize and will help preserve the sharpness when posting. I put birds and wildlife in one folder, landscapes in another, and astrophotography in a third, with descriptions that can help me find them later, like red fox kits fighting or bald eagle backlit snow. If I want to use a photo later for a print or a calendar, I'll just go back to my photo and re-export it in higher quality and larger dimensions for that use. I put all my print sales in a new folder, as if I sell a print multiple times, I reuse the same file if the aspect ratio requested is the same. After I have my photos imported into Lightroom, I now focus on video footage. You can't do much with video footage in Lightroom, so I handle my video footage outside of it. I create folders by species and download the video in there. There are more sophisticated ways to catalog video, but this works for me. The next step is tedious, but important. I go through the video files and delete the bad ones and rename the files for the good ones, placing them in a selects subfolder. The file name often includes behavior so that I can find it later, like bald eagle grab fish or great blue heron flip food. If I don't rename them as I go, I'll never find what I need later. And if I don't call out the junk, it takes valuable space and makes finding things later much more difficult. I put drone footage in a separate folder, as well as footage from my Atomos field recorder in a separate folder too. When I'm looking for footage from those, my needs are usually very specific, so I sort those by the medium and the location or species description. For making videos, I tap into all those folders using my video editing software, DaVinci Resolve. Now, after I've backed up my photos, I leave my photos on my card, usually till the next time I go out. That way, my backup storage has created duplicates by then, and I start off a new photography outing by reformatting the card to create new file structures rather than deleting photos. I've never lost a photo since starting this strategy, and it works for me. Now let's talk backup strategy. Where do I keep all these files? First, remember my Lightroom catalog that stores all the changes I've made to my files? I keep a working copy of my catalog on my PC, as it works better that way. 
Also, I keep a database of all my DaVinci Resolve video work on my PC also. As such, every once in a while, I back up my catalogs and my databases on my external drives in case my laptop is lost or irrevocably damaged. The best practice in backups is the 3-2-1 method. Three backups, two on-site, one off-site. Now I do this professionally, so I go with the best practice. As a hobbyist, two backups can work pretty well, but you want them stored at different locations. In the California wildfires a few years ago, some photographers lost everything when they lost their homes to the fire. Make a copy of your photos somewhere in the house and a second copy of your files and leave it at your mom's house, for example. Refresh the backup every once in a while. Now a cloud copy on top of that is still a good idea. So at home, I have what's called a NAS, a Network Attached Storage. I've been using products by Synology for the last several years and they've been great. They haven't paid me for this video, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say thanks for sending me a new device in the last week as I beef up my storage before I go to Botswana, where I may come home back with five or 10 terabytes of data, even after daily culling. A NAS is a device that holds hard disk drives, usually more than one, and is connected to the internet as well as your computer. It stores and manages your data and can be set up to store duplicates of your data as well for redundancy. So if you have a two bay NAS like this Synology DS220 that I've had for a few years, you can set it up that one drive stores your data and the second drive is a copy of the first. That way, if one drive fails, the second is a carbon copy and you can just replace the defective drive and reload the data back onto the new one. Now note that to get one terabyte of storage, you need twice that in drives, one drive for storage and the second for the duplicate. I have two four terabyte drives in there right now that are starting to get full. So I plan to replace it with a new four bay device, Synology's new DS923+. The new one is a really capable device, great for me as I edit video directly off my NAS. So the ability to have faster file indexing and transfers is awesome. It can handle 10 gigabit ethernet. And if I was sharing my data with a lot of collaborators, it could handle lots of concurrent users. With a four bay device, you have even more storage and different ways to back up your files. I currently have two 16 terabyte drives in one NAS and the new one is gonna get these super fast Seagate Wolf 10 terabyte drives. I'll put four of these in there and have a great system to last me a few years. I also use the Synology software that comes with it. You can run regular tests on the memory, see how much room you have left and a host of other features. The most critical for me is hyper backup. This is what I use to backup my files. Note that having duplicate drives isn't really backup. If you delete the wrong file by mistake or get a virus or a hacker gets access to your files, both of your drives will be compromised. Hyper Backup allows you to choose whatever backup option you want, including USB drives, Google Drive, or anything else you want to use. I use Synology's C2 Cloud Backup Service and I like it. It works seamlessly with my NAS and lets me know when my backups are being done and what room I have left. I also back up my whole laptop on the cloud on a regular basis using the Synology C2 Backup. If my PC goes kaput and needs to be repaired or reloaded from scratch, I can do that. If you thought the feature in Lightroom where you can sort your images by focal length or camera or settings was pretty cool, but you don't use Lightroom, Synology actually has a photo app that can do that for you too. Pretty neat actually. And I promised you a bonus tip. Remember earlier we talked about the fact that Lightroom makes a catalog that stores your changes. It also stores the location of your photos in your memory or storage. So it says, apply the changes in brightness and crop it this way to this photo right here. For this to work, it needs to know where the photos are located. If you move your photos without Lightroom knowing, it won't be able to apply those changes to the photos. As such, when you move photos, use Lightroom to move the photos. You do that over here on the left by creating folders and clicking and dragging photos from one file to another. That way, Lightroom always knows where your photos are stored. So never move your photos around that you've processed in Lightroom using File Explorer in Windows or Finder on a Mac. If you do, you're gonna have tons of trouble trying to get Lightroom to refine your photos to apply your changes to them. Speaking of Lightroom, if processing bird photos in Lightroom is something that interests you, click here. I hope you can go out and use this information so the next time you come home with your own unique, amazing photos, you can take care of them and enjoy them for a long, long time. I know you can do it.